27, 19 through 26. We stand today in honor of the reading of God's word. And the King James text today reads, And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it should be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. Amen. Father, we thank you, God, today for the word of the Lord. It is today our bread. It is our water, it is our sustenance. The Word of God brings life, for in the life of a believer, we need faith, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And Lord, you declare that without faith, it is impossible to please you. Master, today, I am weak in body, I'm frail, Physically, I need the anointing more than I ever have needed the anointing. I need you to anoint my flesh. I need you to anoint this old body. I need you to anoint my mind. I need you to anoint my lips. Lord, every time I step into the altar, I, uh, into the pulpit, I want to do the people of God some good service. I want to faithfully execute my calling. I want, Lord, to be able to bring to your people the Word of God, not just a sermonette for Christianettes, but I want to be able to bring, Lord, a message that originated in the throne room of glory so that I might stand before the people of God and I might deliver, thus saith the Lord. Help me, God, today, for I believe this is a powerful prophetic word, necessary, essential for this very moment in time in our nation's history. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Our story today where I began to share the scriptures today is kind of, you know, somewhere about middle of this particular tale. And I, I didn't want to start at the beginning because obviously we'd be reading and reading and reading, you know, the whole story for quite a time. But while they were, Paul was taken into custody and he was being carried to Rome by Roman soldiers. And the intent was that he should stand before Caesar himself. Back in biblical times, when you took a journey by sea or by land, it was a long journey. It sometimes could take weeks of travel to get from one location to the next and 
they would have to stop at various ports along the way in order to resupply the ship and in order to take on new crew and let some of the old crew have time off, you know, so the men could be refreshed and they could keep the vessel moving forward. And when they arrived at Crete, the Apostle Paul received a prophetic warning concerning an impending storm that would be capable of destroying the vessel upon which they were riding. And Paul tried to warn his captors, and he tried to warn the captain of the ship, but they didn't much want to hear that little one God, Jesus name, apostolic Jewish preacher. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. I'm going to tell you, I understand that. Because I don't know how many times God will tell me something about something that's coming and I'll sound a warning. And guess what, Johnny? Nobody wants to listen. Nobody wants to pay attention. They want to go by what they think they know. They want to go by what they think they see. They want to go by their own experience and their own skills. Well, I've got news for you, folk. God is able to see well past your experience. God is able to see well past your skills. God is able to see things you cannot see. And when God tries to speak to the church through the prophetic, it's pretty wise to listen. But I'm going to tell you, even Paul wasn't the best at listening. Before he went to Jerusalem, before he wound up being taken in chains and Loaded up on that ship, Paul had been warned not to go to Jerusalem. Because if he did, he was going to go through this very thing. And Paul chose to ignore that warning. And he went to Jerusalem anyway. So, sometimes you reap what you sow. <laughs> Amen. Paul didn't always pay attention. Well, guess what, Paul? Your listeners don't always pay attention either. Am I guilty as a child of God of sometimes not listening to the Lord, not paying close enough attention, or choosing to be a little petulant and go my own way? Um, yeah. It's happened a time or two. <laughs> so sometimes you reap what you sow, preacher. You know, folk don't listen because you haven't listened. Hello now. But Paul in our story, in our text today, Paul is in the ship and a great storm has come upon them as he had warned. And the word of God tells us that things were so bad that they were throwing the tack, the tackling off of the ship. You know what the tackling is? That's the stuff that helps you to steer the thing. That's the stuff that helps you to keep the boat afloat. That's the stuff that helps you to manage that vessel so it goes where you want it to go. But when things get severe enough in the storm, sometimes it's safer to get rid of the tackling and just let the boat float and hope that the boat stays afloat. And wherever it lands up, it lands up. But at least you hope that you will remain alive. And the Word of God tells us that when all hope was lost, when all hope was gone, when it became abundantly obvious that in spite of all their effort, in spite of all they could possibly do, that ship was going down. There was nothing more to throw overboard. All they had left were the men. All they had left were the human beings that were on board the ship. Man, I'm going to tell you, it was a dark hour. We're living at a time in our nation today. Some of you may remember that this old preacher told you that as Obama was leaving office, I do believe, if I can say I told you so, I do believe I warned that all hell was going to break loose in this country. Did I not say that? I can't hear you. Yep. 
I was going to say, if I can't hear you, people on the CD can't hear you either. People on the internet can't hear you either. I told you, did I? I said, all hell is going to break loose in this country. I told you that before it was all said and done, there was going to be tremendous violence. I told you before it was all said and done that we very likely would no longer have a democracy. This was years ago, am I telling the truth? I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm not talking about since Donald Trump got elected. Long before Trump was even running for president, I was saying this. Yep. Say, I know I was, because Johnny, I was already throwing tackling over the side of the boat. I was doing everything I had to do to try to keep this thing afloat. You know, we watched on Wednesday night over at the house, we watched a video of Brother uh, Teddy. Wonderful, marvelous, apostolic man of God. Tremendous man. Had, were y'all able to see the video of it at all uh, from Wednesday night? No, I didn't. Okay. Well, Brother Teddy is a marvelous man of God and he preached this message and it was so interesting because during the course of his message, he was talking about the prophetic and those who operate in the prophetic. And some of the things he said about those who operate in the prophetic, he said, they look crazy. He said, you won't never understand them. You won't never get them. Isn't that what he said, Tommy? said, you won't get them. You won't understand them. He said, they'll do things that you'll just think are crazy as all get out. They'll do the craziest things because they're operating in the prophetic. God has revealed something to them, and they know it. They know it in their spirit to be so, uh, Bill. You know, uh, it's not a matter of, of saying something and say, all right, now let's wait and see if it happens or not. No, when God is using you in the prophetic, you, you feel that experience. You feel what you're prophesying before it's ever arrived. So if you're prophesying of war and destruction and death, then the prophet is he's so certain of this coming that he's already feeling distressed over it. He's already feeling anxiety over it. Do you follow what I'm saying? He's already experiencing it, so to speak, because he is that certain of what God has spoken. Well, I've been trying to warn people for years now. When I came to Dallas, Texas, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, that there was a great financial crash coming to America. There was going to be a massive financial blowout. Did I not say that? Yes. Long before 2008, I was saying this. When I say long before, I mean years before, not months, not weeks. Years before, I was warning people to be very careful about meats or purchases. I was warning them to be very careful about budgets. I was warning them about saving. I was warning them about, uh, the, not warning them, but I was advising them to do everything in their power to maybe set some supplies ahead. I don't mean uh, supplies like, uh, you know, uh, doomsday supplies, but what I mean is in order to help you through a difficult financial time, it's not a bad idea to have a great soap and a great deal of laundry detergent and a great deal of uh, body wash and a great deal of shampoo. This way, if you get laid off, this way, if you lose your job, if things get hard, you've already got a nice supply of these things, you know what I'm saying? That's the kind of advice, wasn't I, giving the church. And I was telling people, don't, don't go into a rent that's going to be way over your head. You know, if you rent a place, rent 
try to pick something that is as inexpensive and reasonable so that if your job is affected, you won't be homeless overnight. And Johnny, I tried to give advice like this for years before 2008 came. And then the real estate bubble burst. And then the banks began to close. And then the government began to take over financial institutions. And then Chrysler was on the verge of folding. And then uh, GM was on the verge of folding. You, you know what I'm talking You remember what I'm talking about now. I was warning of these things years beforehand. I warned us that if Donald Trump were allowed to step foot in the White House, our democracy was in great peril. Did I not say that? Said if that man is allowed to even so much as step foot into the White House, we've let him get away with too much. And we are not going to be able to stop what's coming. We're not going to be able to stop the storm that he is going to bring to our society and to our nation. Said ultimately we're going to see violence. He is going to push and push and push and push every emotional button that he can push in this country. He is going to push every divisive, dividing button that he can push with the sole intent of inspiring and inciting a civil war. The GOP, I'm just going to say it today, wants, wants this country to break out in massive violence from east to west coast. They want that to happen. And you might say, well, why in the world? Let me tell you, the GOP has been setting the stage for this for many, many, many years, folks. You know, I was a Republican for a good part of my life. I don't ever remember liberals or Democrats bringing accusations against the Republicans like I've watched the Republicans bring accusations against the Democrats. You know, we've got Trump now, oh, this is going to drive me crazy, we've got Trump now going to his rallies and literally declaring in his rallies that Democrats are evil. Did you see that recently? He has a, oh, they're just evil! They're just evil. They're nothing but obstructionists. They're nothing but, you know, they're just trying to stand in the way of progress. Um, excuse me, I got news for you. The entire eight years that Barack Obama was in office, the Republicans did nothing but run interference. Every minute that man was in the White House, the Republicans did nothing but run interference. How come when the Republicans do it, it was the right thing to do. When the Democrats do it, they're wicked and they're evil. Mm -hmm. But I've watched, Tommy, even when I was in the Republican Party. Part of the reason I'm not in the Republican Party today is because I saw this foolishness. And I saw this stupidity. And I, I could not support it. I couldn't be part of it. I said, this is absurd. The, the Republican Party is manipulating its membership emotionally and psychologically using all this hyperbole, using all this blown up accusations and blown up language and all these demonizations and all these accusations. And I saw that many, many years ago. I said, uh, something ain't right here. And back before, somewhere around 2005, I preached a message while George W. Bush was in office. I preached a message Tommy would recall because he was there. And it was called The Man Who Would Be King. And I preached then, then, that the GOP 
wanted to establish a dictatorship. They wanted to do away with the Constitution, and they wanted to establish a king or a dictator. Didn't I? Mm -hmm. I preached that then, folks. That's how far back I knew we were coming to this. And I've been watching for years as they have set the stage. They keep amping up. And then, of course, we had Fox News. And Fox News just makes sure they pump their people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with all this negativity, with all this demonization, with all this, oh, the liberals are evil, they're wicked, they're horrible, they're terrible. And they're, they're helping to serve as the propaganda machine. And they've been doing it long before Trump came off. Long before Trump, see, Trump is not some surprise that happened to come upon the scene. Oh, no, 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 no. He's part of the plan, folks. All that acting during the, during the election, all the Republicans who said, Oh, I don't agree with what he said. I think it's terrible that he said that. That was all acting. That was all a ploy so that they would look like they weren't behind him. So it would look like they didn't support him. But the whole time they wanted him in office. Because the man is psychotic. And he'll be willing to do what is needing to be done when all hell breaks loose. See, when a dictatorship is set up, one of the first things you have to do when you set up a dictatorship, you have to either imprison or kill all of your perceived enemies. Usually what you do is you just classify people in groups. In other words, for instance, if I were Donald Trump, and I were trying to define who my enemies are, well, who would you pick? Well, one would be Democrats, right? So you've got to get rid of all your top leadership, all your political leadership, all of your armed, force, armed forces members, and all of your armed forces leadership that identifies as Democrat. Well, there's another group of people who would be classified as enemies because 90-something percent of them voted against him and they don't like him and they don't like what he stands for and that's people of color. Hello now. You see, here's how Adolf Hitler did it. Adolf Hitler started out with Jews and then all of a sudden we have to throw in gypsies. All of a sudden, we have to throw in homosexuals. All of a sudden, we have to throw in Jehovah's Witnesses. These are groups that were all placed in camps in World War II Germany. But you see how they did it? They did it in big clumps. They did it according to group. Homosexuals will be on that list because that's throwing meat to his base. The religious right. They're, right now, the only people in the country that want anything to do with this man is the religious right. So he's got to do everything in his power to keep them as happy as he can keep them. So you're going to have Democrats, people of color, that includes blacks and Hispanics, homosexuals, anyone who identifies as liberal, and those people have to be eliminated. They either have to be imprisoned, that's if you're merciful, or they have to be killed. This is what happens when a dictatorship is set up. Say, Pastor, why are you talking about these things? I'm trying to tell y'all we're in a storm. We're in a big storm. It looks right now like... There's not a whole lot of hope of survival. It doesn't look like this country's going to survive the storm. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? It doesn't look like the country's going to survive the storm. And it's not. Not as it is today. It's not going to It's not going to look like it does today in another two or three years. It won't look at all like it does today. Just watch. 
Say, Pastor, you're depressing me. Hang in there. I've got some good news. The title of my message is A Word of Hope in Troubled Times. So don't, don't get too depressed yet. Paul got up in our primary text today, and you know what he started out with, Johnny? He started out with an I told you so. He said, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you when we were in Crete that we should not, you know, take up anchor and start our journey? Didn't I warn you that we should get to this point? Hello now. Yes, he did. He started out with an I told you so. And, of course, nobody likes to hear an I told you so. But when the guy's right, he's right. I hope somebody today is looking at this old preacher and realizing when you're right, you're right. Maybe now that we're in the middle of the storm, somebody will listen to what I'm trying to tell them. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Maybe now, Tommy, somebody will pay attention because I've been warning about this for years and we're right in the big middle of it and it's a disaster. But I want to tell you, when dictators come into power, there's... A number of things that then happen that are kind of the, I guess you'd say the automatic byproduct of going from a democracy to a dictatorship. Intrigue, murder, assassinations become commonplace. You see, a dictator constantly, constantly, every minute of every day, has to guard his position. You see, when we're operating as a democracy and everybody's following the law and everybody's going according to the Constitution, the president don't have to worry every minute of every day that he's going to be thrown out of office. Hello now. No, because we're following a set of rules. We're following a set of guidelines. We're following the, the, uh, the rule of law. But when you set up a dictatorship and all of a sudden the Constitution is thrown out the window, uh, well, guess what? No rules means no rules. You can't throw all the rules out the window and expect people all of a sudden to... Do things just the way you want it to be done just because you say so. It don't work that way. I like to play Monopoly online, uh, on uh, my computer sometimes. I like to play, you know why I like to play Monopoly seriously? It reminds me of how life works. You win some, you lose some. Sometimes you land on a place a bill where you got to pay a tax and sometimes you land on a place where you get a $200 rebate. Sometimes you land on a property where you got to pay a high rent and sometimes you land on a, on a space where you wind up getting something. Do you know what I'm talking about? And that's just, it, that's how life is. You have good days and bad days. Sometimes you lose today and yet tomorrow you win. You know, today something bad happens, tomorrow something good happens. It's just that is the nature of life. Things are up and down, you know. And so when I play Monopoly, honest to God, it just kind of reminds me of, well, there may be setbacks over here, but don't worry because down the road a ways, things may very much change. Well, when I play Monopoly, my computer... The game on my computer gives me the option of what they call house rules. So I can go in, Johnny, and I can change the rules up a little bit. And instead of playing the game the way that the manufacturer has set it up, I can change certain things. Like when you land on Park Place, instead of it being a free parking spot, you know, you can actually get a $250 bonus every time you land on Park Place. I can do it either $250 or I can do it $500. So when you land on Park Place, I mean not Park Place, when you land on free parking is the, you know, the block. Instead of it being just a free spot, 
You actually get something when you land there. I can set that in the rules. I can determine how many houses and how many hotels are available during the course of the game. I can determine how many houses, either four or five, you have to buy in order for it then to become a hotel. In other words, some you can play it so that you buy four houses and the fifth one is a hotel, or you can set it up where you have to buy five houses and the sixth one is a hotel. Well, I like to change rules up a little bit, make the game a little more interesting. I'm just playing against the computer. I'm not playing anybody, you know. But So I'm playing by rules that I've set. But when a dictator comes into power, guess what? All rules are suspended. There are no rules. You know what happens in a lot of places, Johnny, when a dictator comes into power? Before too long, he gets knocked off. Because there's no rules. And the enemies of that dictator say, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to have him at the top of the heap. We're not going to have him running the show. And next thing you know, they're assassinating him. And then if you're not careful, you've seen this in a lot of your South American countries. You've seen this overseas. If you're not careful, before too long, the guy that knocked off the first guy winds up getting knocked off. When you set up a dictatorship, the head of state, the person at the top of the heap, is extremely vulnerable. Extremely vulnerable. You don't know how many people are wanting to get that person out of the way. And this is why, if a dictatorship is established, it has to be brutal. It has to be brutal. They have to knock off top military leadership. They have to knock off political leadership in the opposition. They have to knock off influential voices in the opposition. They have to, because that is the only way you can make that position even the least bit secure. But a dictatorship, by reason of its nature, is very insecure to begin with. There's no such thing as a secure dictator. The problem is the more positive, excuse me, the more popular a dictator is, then the less likely he'll be toppled or she'll be toppled. Say, okay, pastor, what are you talking about? Paul had warned his captors of setting off to sea having been prophetically forewarned of doom concerning the voyage. But as is so often the case, the prophet was ignored as the ship's captain placed his trust in his own vision, his own experience, and his own skills. So they set off to sea only to find that Paul's warning was valid. As the seas tossed and the situation grew worse and worse, Paul once again arose with word from the Lord. This time it was a mixed message. Some of it was good and some of it not so good. The ship would in fact be lost. But an angel had told Paul during the night that not one single life would be lost. So the news was good and bad. The ship's going down. But we're going to make it. Hallelujah. Now are you hearing me today? I told you I've got a word of hope in troubled times. I want you to listen to me. The ship's going down, but we're going to make it. Hallelujah. The ship is going down, but we're going to make it. Listen to me now. When... God has a plan for our lives. No storm that besets us will be able to destroy us. Paul was bound for Rome, and come hell or high water, if you'll pardon the term, he was going to make it to Rome because God wanted him to make it to Rome. I don't believe for one minute that God rose up the affirming a Pentecostal movement 
and the affirming Pentecostal message and this church and this pastor, I don't believe for one minute that God raised us up so we can go down with the ship. Hello now. I don't believe for one minute that the destruction and the death and the mayhem that we are looking at today is going to destroy what God has helped us to begin. Why? Because I believe there's more to this story. I believe God's got more to this plan. I think there's more going on. I had a vision for the LGBT community when I started this ministry uh, 25 years ago. I had a vision for our community that God would send revival to LGBT people. And I've got news for you today. That's where I've been sailing to ever since I started doing this work. And I believe God is going to help us to reach our destination. Because God don't give you a vision of a place you'll never get to. Hello now. I believe that God has given me a vision. And I believe that vision will in fact come to pass. You know the circumstances that are coming upon us may very well be the best thing that ever happened to us. Because it is going, <laughs> it's going to scare the devil out of a lot of people. When HIV and AIDS came, all oh, the affirming churches filled up. Old Cathedral of Hope over there, they built that great, big, beautiful building that they got. Mm -hmm. Guess when they built it? During the midst of the AIDS crisis. Am I telling the truth? See, I know I'm telling the truth because I know people who are on the board over there and they've told me. They said, oh man, during the, during the AIDS crisis when people were dying left and right, people were scared, they were afraid, and all of a sudden people were willing their estates and willing all kinds of money to Cathedral of Hope so that they could build this building. All of a sudden, people wanted to buy their way into heaven. Hello now. All of a sudden, Bill, the church house filled up. All of a sudden, COH was called the biggest affirming church in all of North America. Am I telling the truth? I'm not picking on Cathedral of Hope. I'm just I'm stating some facts. They don't have the attendance today they had 20 years ago. No. Nope. Not by a long shot. No, because once the AIDS crisis subsided, so did the attendance. So did the giving. So did the estate planning. All of a sudden, everything changed, right? Oh, yeah, because everything's going good. Well, I got news for you, folks. God said, I believe God spoke to my spirit that he had a revival in the works for the LGBT community. Well, with what is coming, I think it's going to scare the devil out of a whole lot of LGBT people. And they're going to start running for God. And they're going to start running again for the church. And they're going to start running again for help where their help can only come from. You hear what I'm telling you now? So while we're looking at the events that are to come as being this great calamity and this great horrible thing, God is saying, no, there is something good that I can pull out of this. Hallelujah. There is something positive that I can pull out of this. If you can believe me and if you can trust me, I am able to take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it to good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to tell you, I believe with all my heart that this is what's coming. That while on one hand, things look very bleak. Things look very dark. Because it appears the ship is lost. And Paul said, I heard from the Lord. An angel of the Lord came and spoke to me and he let me know the ship is going down. The ship is going down. I got news for you today, folks. The ship is going down. But 
Hallelujah. There's good news in the midst of the bad news. And that is this. There shall be no loss of life on this ship. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to tell you something. There were other ships in the water that Paul wasn't on. And those ships went down and their payload was lost and their passengers died. Paul wasn't on that ship. That ship was not party to carrying out the plan of God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Right. Oh my goodness. Not every church in America today is party to carrying out what God's trying to do. Not every church in America today is trying to do what God wants to be done. Not every church in America is trying to bring revival and hope and help to people who otherwise feel hopeless and lost and cast aside. But those who are on the ships that are trying to do God's work, who are trying to follow God's plan, who are obeying what God's called them to do, and they're going in the direction that God called them to go. Guess what, Tommy? Even though the ship may be lost, we won't be. Because God says, no, I need you to get to your destination. I need you, Paul, to stand before Caesar. Hallelujah. I need you, Grace Oasis, to lead LGBT people back to me. I need you to offer them the message of hope and help. I need you to preach the message of restoration. I need you to bring them the good word of the gospel that grace works for everybody and not just some. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you when the Holy Ghost spoke this to my spirit this week, I said, well, thank you, Lord, because I've been a little worried about things. I've been seeing things fall apart. I've been seeing the storm raging high. And I, I must admit that it felt more and more helpless and hopeless by the day. And then on top of that, it feels like me personally, I've been going through so much lately, you know. And I don't always understand, Johnny, I don't always understand. I'll say, Lord, I, I can't say I understand why you're allowing me personally at this time. We already have so much going on in our country. We already have so much going on in our church. And then on top of that, I get a diagnosis of leukemia. Now I've got to fight a whole nother battle on a whole nother front. Hello now. I don't know about y'all, but I, I, you know, I get a little tired sometimes having to fight so many battles. But then I'm reminded of what Paul the Apostle wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. I couldn't remember what I'd do with my glasses. <laughs> Paul said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. We are troubled on every side, <laughs> yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Say, Pastor, what was Paul saying? Paul was saying, sometimes God allows these calamities and these distresses to come upon us so that when it's all said and done, everybody knows he did it because you couldn't. Amen. Hello now. <laughs> right. 
Everybody knows God did it because, listen, I had so much going against me, it's a miracle I could even get up and walk. It's a miracle I could even get up and preach on Sunday. It's a miracle I could even do the work that I'm doing. But when it's all said and done, God will receive the glory. Hallelujah. It's not about me. If God has to set me back to make sure he's at the forefront, then so be it. Hallelujah. Let all the glory go to Calvary. I don't want any glory. I don't want any credit. I don't want any praise. Hallelujah. So that reminds us that in the midst of all the bad circumstance, you know what? God is working. God's working. It doesn't matter. We're distressed, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. Oh, yeah, we get knocked back, but we get up again. Oh, hallelujah to God. Paul said, no matter what comes our way, our body is fragile. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. God has given us his great Holy Ghost. But that great Holy Ghost is in a body that is subject to sickness, that is subject to, to disease, that is subject to becoming weary, that is subject to distress, that is subject to anxiety. Hello now. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. He said, oh, God's given us something great, but look at the vessel it's in. The vessel it's in ain't so great. Hallelujah. But what's in the vessel's great. There you go. said, so you know what? The vessel may break down. But if the vessel breaks down, it's only to demonstrate that what's in the vessel is so wonderful. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. So guess what? God has a plan for us. I believe. How many of y'all believe God's got a plan for us? Amen. How many believe God's got a plan for this church? Amen. I don't think this plan is going to end if we wind up with a dictator in the White House tomorrow. I don't believe God's plan for us is over because of that circumstance. No, we may have to take an alternate route to get where we're going. The ship will go down. Some of us are able to swim. We'll swim to the island. Some of us are going to have to grab hold of a board here and there and float to the island because we're not that great a swimmer. But every one of us will get to the island. And you know, while you're on that island, the Apostle Paul was gathering firewood so they could build a fire. And as he was gathering that firewood, the Word of God said, that a serpent, a snake, bit him on the hand and it literally attached itself to his hand. And the type of snake that it was was well known in those parts. Extremely volatile. Extremely dangerous and deadly. And the word of God said, Paul, shoot that old snake off into the fire. And he proceeded to go about his work and he was unaffected. Guess what happened? He was able to bring every one of those men that had gone down in that ship with him to the Lord Jesus Christ because God, in the midst of that negative circumstance, demonstrated his power and revealed his glory through the Apostle Paul. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, when things get really bad, that's when God gets really good. Hallelujah! When we wind up having to stop on an island that wasn't part of our original journey, it wasn't part of our original trip plan. Don't worry. We may wind up off course a little bit. We may not go the route we thought we were going to take. But in the process, God is going to be doing some wonderful, powerful, miraculous things. Hallelujah. Now, I told you this is a message of hope in troubled times. Are you hearing a little bit of the hope now? I know the beginning of it sounded a little, you know, depressing. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I know that. Believe me. But are you hearing the hope now? Are you understanding what God's trying to tell us today? Lastly, this afternoon, I'm having an awful time trying to preach. I probably sound terrible, and 
you folks are probably saying, boy, this is the worst sermon he's ever preached. It probably is. Because I am so tired. I'm having a dickens of a time. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 30, the Apostle Paul writes, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Can you imagine spending a day and a half in the waters of the ocean just floating on a piece of wood or what have you until finally you hit a piece of land? Can you imagine? That's got to be a scary thing. Verse 26, In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers. We just had our band stolen a few days back. It's been a week. I still haven't heard from the Dallas Police Department. Still, still, a week later. In perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. Paul went down a list a mile long of all the negative things he'd experienced. <laughs> he said, man, I've been in three shipwrecks. I spent a day and a half floating on the waters of the sea. He said, oh, I've been in perils in the city. I've been in perils in the country. I've experienced robberies. I've experienced uh, mates that I was traveling with, people I was traveling with being murdered and killed, said, I've been through all these things. He said, man, I know what it is to be weak. I know what it is to be sick. I know what it is to go through hard times. He said, but you know what? I'll glory in those things. Well, Paul, you're crazy. Why in the world would you glory in those things? Um, excuse me, how many people live to talk about having gone through that many things? <laughs> how many people live long enough to be able to say, God brought me through this, God brought me through that, God brought me through this, God brought me through that. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, I thought about this as I was reading this this week. And I said, you know, Lord, when that old doctor came in and gave me a diagnosis of leukemia, I don't know why it didn't dawn on me right off the starting line. I've been here before. Hallelujah. I've been down this road before. Oh, I want to tell you, I was in a hospital way back in 1989, 1990 with Lyme's disease. And I had a reaction to the medicine they gave me. I should have died, but I didn't. I was in the hospital a couple of years later having breathed smoke in, inhaled smoke from a fire coming up from a manhole in New York City and my lungs became all torn up and all uh, irritated that probably from asbestos. And I wound up in the hospital with pneumonia and I should have died, but I didn't. 
I wound up with a parasite in my system that tried to kill me for a year and a half. I kept losing weight. I couldn't digest food. I couldn't function. I, I had a consistent case, not to sound ugly, but of diarrhea literally for over a year, folks. And the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I should have died, but I didn't. I wound up in 2000 in the hospital on life support for two months. On life support about a month. And the doctor said I had 24 hours to live. I should have died, but I did. Hello now. Oh, I got news for you. <laughs> this leukemia, it's just another thing in a long list of things God's going to bring me through. Hallelujah. It's just another thing in a long list of things that God will have delivered me from. So I'm not worried. I'm not concerned. I'm not fearful. It's just another test. It's just another storm. It's just another peril. It's just another trial. But you know what? I will glory in my infirmities because how many people... How many people can brag about having gone through as many things as I've gone through and they're still here to talk about it? Hello now. How many people can talk about surviving over and over and over and over and over again when I should have been dead? I'm here to tell you folks, God's got a plan. God's got a purpose for this work. He's got a purpose for this ministry. When it's all said and done, I don't know if this ministry is going to be based out of Dallas. I don't know. We may wind up on a different island. That's okay. Our final destination is wherever God wants us to be. Hello now. But He wants us to get the work done. He wants us to do what He's called us to do. I realized this week, I said, Lord, when you first spoke to me about beginning a ministry, an affirming ministry for LGBT people, I, I couldn't even believe you. I, I couldn't even understand what you were asking me to do. But I finally succumbed. I finally gave in and decided, all right, Lord, I'll do what you're asking me to do. And man, it's been a journey. You know that list Paul went down? I can go down a similar list. Oh, well, I've experienced some things. I've experienced robberies. I've experienced false brethren. People in the church who tried harder to destroy me than people outside of the church had. But you know what? Here I stand. Hallelujah. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. When I get on an airplane and I'm going somewhere that I know God wants me to go, I look at those people on that airplane as I'm walking down the aisle to find my seat, and I think to myself, y'all are so blessed, you don't know how blessed you are. Why? Because I'm on this plane. You know what that means? That means we're going to make it where we're going because I'm on this plane. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You're a child of God. If God's called you to do something, if God's got a purpose in your life, then people around you are blessed. When you get on their airplane, they're blessed because God ain't going to let that plane go down because you're on it. Hello now. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? All I want you to know, yes, it's a dark time. Yes, great calamity. We are facing tremendous calamity. But I want to offer you today a word of hope. In troubled times, God's got a plan. And He will bring that plan about. Paul needed to get to Rome. We need to get where we're going. And I'm here to tell you today, even if the ship is lost, we're going to get where God wants us to go. Hallelujah. Are you hopeful today? Does that give you a little ray of sunshine? Would you stand with me this afternoon?